remarks are going to be made by Jake Wurtzman, uh, who is the director of the Institutions and Governance Program at World Resources Institute. He's a lawyer. He specializes in international environmental law and international economic law. Um, I say he heads up this part of WRI's program and has been a very active participant in the cooperation with our institute on a whole series of joint projects that we've been doing up until now. Um, he earlier was a lawyer, program director, and managing director of the Foundation for International Econ Environmental Law and Development um, field, where he uh, provided legal advice assistance to governments, uh, NGOs, intergovernmental organizations uh, on things like representing the alliance of small island states, the famous AOSIS group, uh, in the negotiations on Kyoto, and uh, assisted governments and NGOs as well in presenting their views to the World Trade Organization on uh, uh, environment-related issues. Prior to joining WRI, he was associate director in the Global Inclusion Program of the Rockefeller Foundation. He led their grant-making strategy in, uh, in the areas of IPRs and, uh, and trade policy. And in a subsequent period, he was uh, uh, environmental institutions and governance advisor to the UN Development Program in New York. So uh, he's had a wide array of experience on the legal and advisory aspects of the nexus between environmental issues and trade, and he'll talk in part about that today. Uh, the second presentation will be made by Arvin Subramaniam, who's senior fellow here at the Institute, also at our sister Center for Global Development. He also teaches at uh, SAIS, Johns Hopkins, down the street. Uh, he came to us uh, uh, several years ago uh, after a long career, 15 years at the International Monetary Fund, where he was most recently assistant director in the research department. Prior to that, he worked in the GATT uh, during the Uruguay round. He spent five years on the staff there. So when Arvin proposes linking the IMF and the WTO systems to deal with global trade issues, he knows whereof he speaks. He's worked in both. So he comes with credibility on those fronts. Uh, Arvin does uh, about one op-ed or more per week uh, in the Indian press and internationally. Uh, most relevantly, perhaps, for our purposes today, he has recently been asked by the Minister of Environment in India, who was referred to in the initial presentation, to do a report for the minister uh, taking a fresh look at India's environmental policy. Uh, so we're very hopeful that will lead to some uh, new and constructive policies in India. It's actually led to quite a stir in the uh, environmental community within India, including some uh, resignations by former government officials uh, who fear that Arvind is going to shake things up in his work with the minister. So he'll make our second presentation. Uh, Gary Huffbauer will be the discussant. Gary also senior fellow here, has of course written volumes on trade, uh, international tax issues, uh, investment issues. Uh, he did, as referenced earlier also, write the book uh, about a year ago, Global Warming and the World Trading System, that I think it's fair to say was the uh, comprehensive analysis, to date at least, that links trade issues and climate change issues and suggests uh, ways to uh, move forward that would constructively relate the two and uh, deal with both. So, Jake to lead it off, Arvind and Gary to follow up, and then again, the trio will take the podium to answer questions from the audience. Jake. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Fred, for the introduction and, and the invitation. I hope you're all still with us. Um, I, uh, it, Trevor is always a tough act to follow, but to, to follow him twice is um, a particularly challenging place to find myself in. Well, what, one of the things that I'm going to try to do um, is to, to drag those international institutions that, that Trevor assigned to hell um, back up to the ground level and to explore them and perhaps uh, find um, some, some of the value that, that makes those uh, sandwiches worth enduring. Um, so uh, for, for those of us in, in the audience that um, are multilateralists, are international institutionalists, are international lawyers, the, the question that, that one of the questions that we're presented with following Copenhagen is what institutions can we continue to place our faith in to try to solve such a challenging global problem as, uh, as climate change? 
If you'd asked that question five or six years ago, it would have been clear from the evolution of the Framework Convention and the Kyoto Protocol that those really, those international institutions were at the center of, the, of a landscape of, of trying to solve these problems, and, and, and that, that landscape was relatively fixed. Um, the Kyoto Protocol essentially built on the institutions that had been started under the Framework Convention, and they, they were designed to respond to core functions that were thought to be necessary in order to construct a fair and effective response to climate change. So those core functions include the kind of conference of the parties that we saw in Copenhagen, a rolling diplomatic process that, that does, as was described for the Montreal Protocol, regularly assess the progress that countries have been making in, in implementing their obligations and trying to improve those uh, over time. So you have a conference of the parties that is central to the regime. You also, as we've learned from the lessons of designing international environmental agreements, often need financial mechanisms, mechanisms that essentially provide incentives and side payments for those countries that may be unwilling to move or that may not have the capacity to move quickly enough to solve those problems. So the Kyoto Protocol and the Framework Convention also established financial mechanisms. With the introduction of carbon markets through the Kyoto Protocol, uh, very much with the support of the United States, you also needed, in terms of the international institutional landscape, a new regulatory mechanism to basically allow those markets to function, to ensure that what countries were reporting in terms of the reductions that they were making was, was accurate, but also to set the standards for the creation of international offsets and allowances that could then be traded freely uh, between countries. Markets also obviously involve the, the, the movement across boundaries of environmental goods and services, and, and so the need for information and transparency around what countries are doing in terms of putting in place standards for environmentally friendly products are also essential functions that international institutions that were emerging from the Kyoto process would have uh, provided and, and, and for those parties are providing. And finally, a function that I want to focus on today, uh, just to, 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 as a way of illustrating just how complex the international uh, uh, landscape, institutional landscape has become, is the very important function of, of review, of, of having uh, institutions set in place to establish standards and to require the reporting of countries of what it is that they're doing to fulfill their commitments, to review those reports, to verify those reports, and in some circumstances to create incentives to encourage countries to comply with and to improve their, their performance uh, as, as reported. Well, this complex and quite sophisticated set of institutions that evolved under the Framework Convention and the Kyoto Protocol really do follow from what I think at the time in the, in the 90s, uh, the early 90s and going into the mid-90s, was a great deal of faith that international institutions created by international law could actually provide dependable, reliable, legitimate institutions that could perform these functions on, on our behalf. And they emerge from principles such as the need for multilateralism, the need for transparency, the need for accountability, the need to create scale uh, and, and efficiencies for international markets to, to thrive, and the need to harmonize standards to make sure that markets aren't um, uh, thwarted by individual countries establishing uh, standards individually. These, this, this faith in international law was in part inspired by the, what are now the peers of the Framework Convention, like the Montreal Protocol, which used many of these same techniques to try to design a, a successful ozone uh, regime. But they were also inspired by the rivals, what some people would say would be the rivals to the international environmental regimes, such as the international economic regimes, the investment regimes, and the trade regimes, which also have many of these international institutions performing similar functions around creating transparency, keeping the rules uh, rolling forward and tightening, um, in, ensuring that, that markets remain open and predictable and fair. There was in this landscape, of course, domestic institutions and regional institutions. The European Union Emissions Trading Scheme was mentioned today, and they played an important supporting role to the international functions, but most of the, the, the faith that this, this set of negotiations would succeed and continue to thrive were placed in what the UN was able to design in the Framework Convention and the Kyoto Protocol. There were some minor concerns about friction and competition from other regimes. Uh, the designers of the, of the Kyoto Protocol were aware that countries might put in place, in order to achieve their climate policies, measures at the border that might create some frictions. And so you see principles in the Framework Convention and the Kyoto Protocol anticipating the need to, to, to moderate and mediate uh, that tension and, and to try to maintain the jurisdiction to oversee any conflicts that might arise a result, as a result within the UN and not within the WTO system. So there was an awareness that there might be some friction between other uh, international institutions. 
Similarly, um, you see uh, disputes between what are the traditional donor countries that tend to support the Bretton Woods institutions like the World Bank and the traditional recipient countries, the developing countries, which, which tend to support institutions like the United Nations-based institutions, fighting over which of those uh, organizations would have the primary role in providing international finance uh, for the support of these regimes. But basically, the primacy of the, of the, of the framework convention and its conference of the parties and the Kyoto Protocols of similar institutions were, were, not really, um, were not really challenged. What has happened since then, of course, reveals that that last landscape has fractured, um, it has been um, fragmented, and the faith in those international institutions to come up with the solutions, um, I think, has diminished significantly, and the space that we are in now uh, is, is creating a, a much more um, difficult landscape made up of, of plurilateral institutions that, that, that Trevor describes, subsets of, of countries, reinvestments in domestic institutions. You see some of the, the, the developing countries, for example, setting up their own funds nationally to receive payments from donor countries rather than wanting to rely on either the World Bank or the UN as implementing agencies. You see specialized funds emerging amongst groups of countries that want to, to fund, for example, reduced emissions from deforestation and degradation, the, the red process. So a real kind of proliferation of institutions, not uh, any of which has yet been invested with the same uh, level of, of confidence that the, the UNFCCC and the Kyoto Protocol uh, once, uh, once enjoyed. In some ways, this, this fragmentation is good. It, it thickens the institutional landscape. We see uh, the investment in the creation of new institutions being, being given mandates to carry forward uh, the, the, the principles and objectives of the Framework Convention. But it also, as it thickens, also begins to blur uh, in terms of the responsibilities, um, the transparency, and the accountability uh, of these systems as we move forward. What I wanted to do in order to illustrate some of the challenges that this now very much more fractured and fragmented uh, landscape might present is to look at one of the functions that still is quite unequivocally viewed by most parties as necessary moving forward uh, in terms of a, of a climate change regime. And that's this, this uh, concept of MRV that Jennifer mentioned, one of the um, many acronyms that you need to, to master if you're going to talk uh, climate. What MRV means is measurable, reportable, and verifiable. And it describes both the nature of the commitments of, and pledges that countries expect each other to make under a future climate change regime, but it also implies the kinds of institutions and procedures that you would need to establish. So the commitments need to be measurable, reportable, and verifiable, but then you need institutions that can perform those functions of measuring, receiving the reports, and verifying that data as being, as being accurate. Essentially, this is a set of rules, procedures, and institutions that will build trust by setting common standards for how countries are going to report, that will build trust through verifying the data that comes uh, from, from countries as they begin to report on their progress, and then hopefully move towards a kind of a compliance regime uh, that would actually hold countries accountable should what they report uh, prove, out, uh, prove to be not verifiable or inconsistent uh, what uh, third party data reveals is what uh, they may be actually uh, doing. Now under the Kyoto Protocol, what we used to call compliance and what is now called MRV actually evolved to a very highly evolved state. Uh, highly evolved in terms of very sophisticated institutions that were actually allowed to send teams in to check uh, through country visits on what countries were actually doing nationally, uh, allowed to bring those reports back to a standing committee of experts that would assess the accuracy of that data, and that was actually empowered the, the enforcement branch of the Compliance Committee under the Kyoto Protocol to impose sanctions on countries that failed to comply, that could lift, for example, their, abil their ability to participate in market mechanisms and uh, may someday, under the compliance uh, uh, system of the Kyoto Protocol, impose uh, actual sanctions on countries that, that prove to have failed to comply. So a highly evolved, highly centralized system. This was a, a small handful of essentially UN-appointed officials that would be carrying out these various uh, functions, but also highly differentiated. The way in which uh, the, the bargain that was necessary in order to create these institutions basically was struck between uh, industrialized and developing countries on the basis of a bargain that these tougher uh, enforcement and compliance procedures would apply only to industrialized countries, though to those that had undertaken specific and binding commitments, but not would apply, would not apply to the to the measures taken by uh, developing countries. 
And this is one of the reasons why, um, as we've heard, the history of the Kyoto Protocol being described, particularly in the United States uh, context, the Kyoto Protocol essentially unraveled as a deal. That, that, that level of highly differentiated, highly centralized, and highly um, ambitious compliance regime was unacceptable to the United States, and, and the deal unraveled um, shortly thereafter. It is interesting, however, as, as we've begun to move under a new administration and with a new sense of commitment by the United States to develop its own climate policy to a new global deal, that the issues of the necessity of a reporting system and a verification system and, uh, have, have come back and have come back in, in the context of this new significant phrase, um, MRV, uh, which is what I want to focus on, on now. We've identified that this function is necessary in, in order to build trust, to verify what each country is doing, um, to build that sense of, of reciprocity, uh, having measurable, reportable, and verifiable commitments, and a system to measure, report, and verify will be essential. But what institutions are we now going to entrust that to? It seems very unlikely that we will rebuild that highly ambitious, uh, centralized, and differentiated system that we had in the Kyoto Protocol. But we can see in the Copenhagen Accord and, and the documents that are leading up uh, to Cancun and then from there on to South Africa, some of the elements that we might find in an MRV in its next, uh, next iteration. And they are complicated. Um, they, they begin, the complication begins in that we have at least three categories of kinds of commitments that will be expressed under the Copenhagen Accord in any future regime, possibly. One is the, is the targets of non-Annex I countries. Um, those are, are relatively straightforward. They look somewhat like the targets that were agreed under the Kyoto Protocol. But then when we reach the non-NX1 countries, the developing countries, we find that the concept of MRE splits them in two. There are supported actions by developing countries, those that are receiving financial support, either from uh, the, uh, the, the typical donor agencies or from the carbon markets. And then there are unsupported actions by developing countries. And part of the deal to agree that this concept of MRV would apply both to developed and industrialized countries required that, that the, the treatment of those two kinds of, of developing country commitments be differentiated with regard to MRV. Essentially, the developing countries insisted that if we're going to carry out MRV of unsupported actions, actions that you are providing us no incentive to undertake or undertaking on our own, we will be MRVing those actions ourselves domestically through our own domestic institutions and will only be those actions that are being funded by the international community or supported by international carbon markets, the supported actions, that can be MRV'd through any kind of international system. So we have those three different categories of pledges or, pledges or actions, the developed country uh, actions and then the supported and unsupported actions of, of developing countries. Four kinds, then, of institutions have emerged to play some kind of role in MRVing those three different kinds of actions or commitments. The first, we already mentioned, are the domestic institutions. So we know that within the United States or within India, there will be a responsibility of the domestic institutions within those countries to measure, report, and verify on whether or not that country and the regulated entities within that country are actually performing as, as pledged in Copenhagen or, or later. So we have Annex 1 and non-Annex 1 developed and developing domestic level institutions that will be playing a role here. We then have the institutions that exist and will hopefully be strengthened under the UNFCCC itself, the Framework Convention. So they will presumably be reviewing Annex 1 commitments. Um, they will also have a role through what's called under the uh, Copenhagen Accord consultation and analysis to review both the supported and the unsupported actions of non-Annex 1 countries. So there will be some kind of, of centralized international multilateral means of, of reviewing what countries have committed to um, through the processes that exist and will continue to be strengthened, hopefully, under the Framework Convention itself. But then, and I think this is relatively new, we have two other potential actors that are doing MRV, and these are the third party actors that aren't domestic <coughs> institutions within the parties, they aren't part of the UNFCCC, but they are third party actors, and they exist at both the international and at the domestic level. At the international level, um, we've heard already that the international financial institutions, like the World Bank, will play, be playing some kind of role in MRVing those actions that are supported through international finance. Um, and those institutions exist, and they have environmental and social safeguards and their own criteria by which they measure whether or not a country is actually spending the money that's been given or lent to them in the way in which they uh, have undertaken to do so.
We've also heard about the G20 playing a role in reviewing whether or not countries are fulfilling their commitments to reduce their energy subsidies, something outside of the UNFCCC, but a third-party evaluator of, of countries' progress. Um, we've also heard about the potential role for the World Trade Organization in resolving disputes between countries uh, should a trade-related uh, dispute emerge. And that will involve an appellate body or a panel second-guessing whether or not a climate policy that's put, been put in place, either by an importing or an exporting country, is somehow sufficient uh, in, in, in order to, to meet, um, uh, for example, the, the general exceptions under Article 20 of, uh, of the GATT. And then finally, we have a category of third-party domestic. Um, so there are, we can see, for example, in the emerging legislation in this country, the establishment of institutions and procedures and standards and rules that will essentially authorize domestic institutions in one country to assess the progress of implementation in fulfilling their pledges in another country. So uh, we've talked a bit about um, border carbon adjustments. We've talked a bit about what, um, uh, uh, Carrie Lieberman. We haven't, yet, we haven't yet described this, but there is a, a required report that has to be um, uh, developed for Congress uh, on a regular basis that will look at the performance of the five biggest emitters that are not OECD members and make judgments as to whether or not they are making significant efforts in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we can imagine that other countries <coughs> similarly will be setting up domestic institutions that will be looking in a third party way at, at the performance um, of, of, of different countries with regard to their, their climate pledges. This complexity, as I've, I've suggested, has been made essential in part by the failure of the Kyoto Protocol, a, a kind of rejection that international institutions in fact can be entrusted uh, with, with all of these aspects of, of, of uh, uh, reviewing countries' performance. And it also emerges from this demand by developing countries that if we are going to subject ourselves from this, for this review, it has to be done primarily by our domestic institutions. So a differentiation has occurred, a greater complexity in the in institutional landscape has occurred as part of the, that new bargain about what a future regime would look like that had to take into account in particular, the sovereignty concerns of developing countries, which were willing to move forward a bit, but not as far as industrialized countries, for example, um, move forward uh, under, the, under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, again, there, this, this means uh, some good things and some bad things. It means now that there will be multiple fronts, domestic, international, within the UN, with outside of the UN, and of institutions that will be entrusted and have the mandate to actually check on whether countries are performing. And for those who are concerned about compliance and want to build uh, an atmosphere of trust and, and, and have the opportunity to verify, that can be a good thing. Um, however, it also introduces a high risk of incoherence and of conflict and of unfairness and of disproportionate exercise of power. And I think, again, you can see all of the symptoms and the potential risks of that by looking at something like uh, Carrie Lieberman and Waxman Markey before that, where it is unclear from the way in which that, that set of, um, uh, of nationally based institutions will operate by what metrics it is going to measure whether or not a country is performing effectively from a US perspective. Are they going to look simply what that country is pledged on the Copenhagen Accord, or are they going to judge another country's uh, performance on the basis of what the US has finally committed itself to perform. By what principles will that assessment be made? Will, for example, a US institution take into account the very important principles that we've evolved in the United Nations of common but differentiated responsibilities that recognize that developing countries need the space to grow and therefore cannot be expected to perform at the same rate that a country like the United States is committing itself to perform to? And then finally, what about the consequences of these reviews? Are the penalties that the United States unilaterally decides is appropriate to impose on a country uh, like Indonesia or India in the context of a trade dispute uh, appropriate consequences? They certainly wouldn't be negotiated multilaterally. And so that, that, that same set of decisions and choices would have to be made by any one of these institutions. And to me, that, that, that really does force us back to the negotiating table or to confront uh, an institutional landscape that is, is rife uh, with incoherence and with the potential for conflict. We have to find a way to either standard, standardize or harmonize or mutually recognize things like uh, what is an appropriate metric to measure progress 
by what principles can we differentiate between different countries at different levels of development, and what are the, the fair, most fair and effective consequences that should flow from a country uh, that may have failed to, to meet uh, its, its pledge. So um, this moves us back into the international negotiations, and for those of us who want to see a glass uh, half full, um, we, we hope that the, the, the re-engagement of the United States and uh, of, of the major uh, um, economies in the UNFCCC process, their, their suggestion that that is the multilateral forum that continues to have legitimacy even post uh, Kyoto Protocol, will mean that some of these issues will, will arise and be negotiated um, through, through that process, and we can, um, we can reaffirm uh, the legitimacy of that space. Uh, for some, of course, that, that seems like a very safe space. It's sufficiently dysfunctional um, that it may not move forward with the answers to any of these questions uh, quickly enough to, to actually um, limit uh, the, the unilateral exercise of, of any of these, uh, these powers. Um, but I think the obligation of, of all of us is to make sure that it isn't uh, so safe a space uh, any longer for those countries that are, that are failing to act uh, and failing to move forward uh, to, to address this, uh, this challenge. Um, so those are, those are some, some reflections on the complexity of the international landscape and, and the challenges uh, ahead. Um, they suggest what happens when you move from top down uh, to bottom up perhaps too quickly. And, and don't appreciate the fragmentation and the institutional gaps that are left behind. And hopefully it, it's part of a, a call for, for um, returning to multilateralism and trying to reinvest in the international institutions that will, will help us to solve these problems. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Uh, thanks, Fred. Uh, and thank you, Trevor, for asking me to speak. <clears throat> So, so I, I guess the topic um, is something that I wasn't sure exactly what um, uh, I wanted to or was supposed to say, but uh, I, I'm going to treat it a little bit like you know, climate change and the evolving economic uh, order, the, the economic system. And um, before thinking about you know, uh, the institutional architecture uh, itself, uh, I thought I'd spell out much more you know, uh, trying to think about you know, cooperation on, on climate change, especially from a perspective of, of, of developing countries, you know, the, especially the, the new powers that are rising. And my overview is, is, is the following, is that you know, Nick Stern called uh, the climate change problem you know, the mother of all externalities and market failures. I, I think if you think about it from, a, from, an, you know, from the international dimension, this is really the mother of all collective action problems. Um, uh, and, and I'm going to uh, substantiate that, that because I think it's really crucial to understanding how we can or probably how we cannot see our way through this uh, cooperation <laughs> game on climate change. Uh, I, I'm going to argue that, you know, that because of this, traditional attempts, uh, the way we think about cooperation, are, I would say, almost completely <coughs> inadequate. Um, I think we need changes in mindset all around, uh, and I really think we need changes in the way we think about what are the policy instruments that are available and who should deploy what policy instruments to induce cooperation. I think the world is upside down and it's high time we started recognizing that. Now, when I think about climate change and, you know, Fred said I've been through all the international institutions, I've worked at the UNCTAD, the FAO, the Commonwealth Secretariat, the World Bank, all these institutions. So when I think about this, I think about, you know, how does climate change fit in with these other models of cooperation? Is it like the World Bank or the IMF? No, because basically when a country comes to the IMF for money, I mean, we all know that it has to adjust, the adjustment that it has to do is basically beneficial, and, and the carrots and sticks broadly work. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they do it kicking and screaming, but they know they have to adjust. You know, even Greece now has to do it. Um, it's kind of changed like trade negotiations in the WTO. And I would argue that uh, absolutely not, because, you know, uh, trade negotiations are about exchanging concessions. Uh, and they do end up working mutually beneficially. So, so the character of, you know, access to each other's markets work. Uh, and so, you know, the whole thing does by and large hang together. So, so climate change is nowhere like, uh, uh, like uh, trade negotiations. I, I see climate change much more like the, like the TRIPS negotiations in, in the WTO or the Chinese exchange rate question in the, in the sense that, you know, the actions that, you know, countries have to take are actually extremely costly. I mean, orders of magnitude very costly. Uh, 
Um, now, it, what happened in TRIPS was that in the intellectual property negotiations, developing countries were very unhappy at assuming these obligations because they thought rightly that it was not in their interest to do so. But finally, they were bribed through side payments in the form of textile access to rich country textiles and clothing markets. So by and large, you know, there were costs. It was not a beneficial thing to do, but there were side payments which made cooperation possible. Now, Fred and Morris and Nick and all of us, you know, carry on about the Chinese exchange rate. And I think we're all totally right, but we're also totally wrong in the sense of you know, uh, thinking that it's possible, because this is a case where China, rightly or wrongly, does not think appreciating it's in its interest. And frankly, none of us, the international community does not have the carrots or sticks to induce China to change. That's the sad reality of the Chinese exchange. <coughs> and I think that actually climate change is trips or the China exchange rate problem to the power of whatever, infinity. And let me say why. So this is a paper I've done with Nancy Birdsall, um, which, you know, look at the last three rows. And in the business as usual scenario, we show that minus, 200, uh, minus 212, that is essentially poor country emissions will rise by about 212%, i.e. triple in a business as usual scenario. So. If developing country equity needs, i.e. The, their growth and energy needs have to be met, and the global target has to be met, that red number 270 is what the equitable reduction in emissions is by the rich countries, i.e. rich countries will have to reduce their emissions by 270% i.e. you have to add carbon sequestration capacity to the, to the atmosphere. It ain't going to happen. Uh, there's another way of looking at this, which is that, you know, look at the, at, at the bottom two rows. Alpha is, is kind of, think of it as a crude technology parameter. So we uh, calculate what alphas do you need to get to in order for the whole thing to work, i.e. to satisfy the equity demands of the poor and meet the aggregate target. So that's kind of the uh, 80 to uh, 20 world reducing by 50 scenario from 1990 levels. And just take the, the, the poor country alpha minus 3.9. In the business as usual, it's minus 1.1. It sounds gobbledygook. It has to basically, this it has to increase by about three, about 2.5. It has to uh, uh, three, in, uh, double by about two and a half times. Now, what is that parameter? It's how much technology has to improve. Now, how do we get a sense for what, what this number means? So we did, so, so what happens, now that first row is actually the alpha, the same number. What happened to that before and after the oil shock? It went from about minus 0.1 to 1.2. But it actually has to go from 1.1 for the poor to about 3.9. So we need to see radical technology changes which will give you a, a lot more growth for a given level of emissions for the whole thing to add up. So, so we're talking about, you know, a, a climate change is totally sui generis in terms of the costs involved for countries of meeting these obligations. Alternatively, if these obligations have to be met, we need a system of cooperation that really has to focus on not just generating new technologies, but on generating radically new technologies for the equity needs of developing countries to be met. So we're in a, in a, in a whole new world of cooperation. So, so what's the, you know, so, you know, so, so that's why this is not like, I mean, you know, the, the, the climate, the environment guys talk about the Montreal Protocol. I'm no expert on the Montreal Protocol, but it seems to me that it's, it's I mean, that is not a parallel that will fly here because the costs and the numbers involved are just totally different. The equity dimensions, the international dimensions are, are, are different in terms of uh, the, the essential sign of the changes and the magnitude of the costs that are going to be involved. So this is really a cooperation, which will uh, uh, an issue which will require cooperation based on, on, on kind of <coughs> perceptions of self-interest. Because frankly, uh, uh, I don't think the US or, or anybody else has either the carrots or the sticks to induce cooperation by China and, and India at this stage. Um, therefore, I think a key a, a, a point here is, which is kind of sounds woolly and waffly, we need bucket loads of trust, harmony, and goodwill because it's all about cooperation and perceptions of this and some in order to make this work. And frankly, we don't have it. We don't have it. Uh, uh, we, okay, 
Uh, let me uh, beat up on the Indians first. Uh, we don't have it in India because, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, until very recently, the attitude of developing countries has been, you know, it's not our problem. We didn't cause it. We have nothing to contribute. So you guys get your act together and, and do all the emissions reductions. We know that's not going to work. But it's also missing hugely in the United States. I mean, <clears throat> Does the United States really appreciate what the equity consequences of climate change actions are for developing countries? And I would say not even close. The US is not close in terms of mindset on this. So when I go to India and tell my friends, oh, India has to change its mindset, they say, yeah, yeah we'll do it. But are your friends in the US changing their mindset? And frankly, I'm stumped for an answer. And why do I say that? I think the mindset in the United States still is that, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, poor countries have to take serious emissions reductions. There's not going to be much financing forthcoming. I'll talk about it a little bit later. And at the drop of hat, the U.S. says trade sanctions. So, so I wrote this piece which resonated a lot with my Indian friends, which is that I compare, you know, the United States to a, to a serial philanderer who says, well, I will maybe commit in the future to episodic philandering, but you, my chaste wife, must wear the chastity belt. Uh, that's kind of the situation that the United States is in, in, in kind of suddenly waking up to climate change, not even doing the actions. We know Lieberman, uh, uh, Kerry Lieberman is not going to anywhere, go anywhere for a long time. Um, so, so, so the U.S. is not even at a stage where it's, it's undertaken serious commitments and then saying, well, and, and establishing uh, goodwill and harmony and so on. So on both sides, I think there's a huge gap which uh, is going to make this very difficult. I think the mindset is changing to some extent in India, to a small extent, because of uh, lots of things happening internally. You know, there was a huge flood in India where the river changed course by 200 kilometers, and not, not, not a little bit, a huge amounts. And, and so that's changing. And, and then, of course, in India, there's the whole threat of the, of the Himalayan glacier retreating, and India becoming a downstream riparian strait from China, which is changing the equation quite a bit. So, so I think things are happening in, in, in India. I wonder whether that's happening in the United States. I, I'm not so sure. So, so here's my, my, my bottom line, as it were. What is what it, it might take, or, or could, needs to take, uh, will take to, to get cooperation on climate change? I think in the rich world, there has to be a genuine appreciation of the problems of reducing emissions when half the population does not have access to electricity. I, I don't think the US is there yet. I, I, I would argue very strongly that on existing technologies, uh, the Indian position, the Chinese position of not undertaking binding emissions reductions is right and it's fair and equitable to not do so because on current technologies it will, it will entail a huge reduction in living standards and access to energy services that, you know, I mean, it's economically undesirable, politically infeasible to sell domestically. But I think where I think in the Indians and the Chinas need to change is uh, in the following respect. So far they've been saying it's your problem, you change. Uh, you take the actions, leave us out, you know, we will do business as usual. But I think that mindset has to change in saying they have to view emissions reductions by the United States and Europe and Canada and the rich countries as an investment in their own futures. Because it's these actions that will generate the technologies that will in turn be, can be used by developing countries to undertake emissions reductions. Uh, and so their approach has to be, what is the minimum that we need to do to finance this investment of ambitious and uh, early uh, emissions reductions actions by the rich world? And that is the critical mindset change that needs to happen because then, you know, both have to say, how do we create a framework for radical technology creation and dissemination? So I think that, that, that's, that's really a, a, an important part of, of the mindset change that needs to happen. I, I think in terms of, you know, the traditional policy instruments, I mean, the United States still, you know, it kind of has a knee-jerk uh, reaction in terms of trade sanctions. Guys, wake up, this is Shemerica, this is the rise of the rest. You know, uh, the US could not credibly undertake trade actions against China uh, on, on the exchange rate. There is no way you can take trade actions against China or India to enforce climate change. It will not work, it cannot work, it should not work. Um, uh, so, so we have to wake up to this new reality. Second, 
And this is my kind of uh, probably the, uh, the, the point most current with recent events. Guys, wake up on financing. The world is upside down. The poor are bailing out the rich. Uh, to think that, you know, to make cooperation possible, the rich world is going to A, be willing to transfer bucket loads of money to the Indias and Chinas of the world is, is kind of cuckoo land. Second, in terms of balance sheets, it's, it's the Chinas and, and the Brazils and some extent the Indias that have the stronger balance sheets to provide financing, not the rich world. Because remember, credible uh, cooperation here requires huge amounts of financing. And there's no way that we're going to have you know, the US and EU commit to huge uh, pools of money to induce cooperation to offset the cost of climate change actions by the Chinas and, and Brazils of the world. The world is upside down. We've got to start thinking afresh about some of these policy instruments, including you know, who has the comparative advantage in supplying which kinds of policy levers like financing uh, and so on. So, so bottom line is that, I mean, I do think that climate change uh, is probably beyond cooperation. I, I think it's probably, I mean, this is the, I think the, uh, one has to be really realistic about this. It's, you know, the costs are huge. Uh, the, 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 the traditional compensation and, and side payment mechanisms are, are not there. Uh, some of them won't work. Some of them can't be uh, generated. So, so we really have to think about, uh, you know, how we change the mindset in terms of perspective and how we think afresh about these levers that we traditionally think of that can be deployed for cooperation. And if uh, these are the two things that I hope to, that I'm working on these days in my report for uh, Jairam Ramesh. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.